Uh, hey everybody, thank you all so much for joining. My name is Owen Hinchy. I am founder and CEO of Times, and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome a friend, colleague, and superstar, um, Matt Petrosky, who is a senior security engineer from OneLogin. Matt, thank you so much for joining and taking the time. How are you doing today? Good, excellent. Super excited to be here. We've had, you know, a good long partnership between, you know, you and I just professionally and now with uh, kind of companies and organizations. So it's, uh, it's super fun to help kind of talk to you about times. Awesome. Thank you, man. Re really, really appreciate you joining. Um, we're going to make yeah. this very much a kind of a show and tell session. So you guys are probably one of our most sophisticated customers in terms of the not just the sophistication of the stories and workflows that you've implemented, but also the way you think about threats and the way you think about like the risks to your business and how automation can be used to mitigate and reduce those risks. Um, so maybe before we get into the walking us through some of the stories that you've prepared to show us today, maybe talk to us a little bit about like your team, what your day-to-day -day works like and how you think about security at a whole at one login. Yeah, so obviously, you know, OneLogin's an identity and access management company. So as we like to say, security is in our blood, um, where, you know, that's that's kind of our, our root and our core kind of founding value is where we're trying to provide security for other companies. So, you know, we want to make sure we're doing it ourselves. Um, so my, my specific team, um, I'm part of a, you know, the incident response team. So we're a, a subset of our larger security team. So um, you know, we have other AppSec folks, full and management folks, but I'm, you know, my team is specifically focused on, um, you know, protecting our corporate and protecting our production environments um, from any <clears throat> malicious actors or threats. Um, we'll manage things like detection engineering and building our new detections out, um, you know, managing our, our threat intel platform and, and looking for, you know, other third party sources or, you know, keeping us on the, the cutting edge of what's going on in the threat landscape. Um, so yeah, you know, our team is, is respectively, it's a little bit smaller. Um, so we lean pretty heavily on automation as kind of the, the main selling point that we use is, um, yeah, we want to make sure that we're staying lean, we're staying efficient as possible, that we're reducing any kind of dwell time or, um, you know, time to respond, um, and, and make sure that we're as effective and efficient as possible because, you know, seconds matter in, the, the cyber landscape, especially these days, it, it moves really quick. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we're agile and uh, and able to move quickly ourselves and respond in a timely fashion. So um, obviously automation is this super cre key integral part of, of everything in that mentality of, um, you know, if we want to be able to respond quickly, well, you know, being able to automate something is, is faster than I can manually type on a keyboard. Um, you know, or if I can automate a job, I can go work on a, a more strenuous manual task. Well, this, you know, regular repeated task happens in the background and, and gets done for me. So, um, yeah, definitely the, the core of everything is automation. Um, and then from there, it's just, you know, what manual tasks are we doing? How do we figure out how to make our lives easier? It just kind of scale and, and grow from there. Awesome. That that really, really great to hear. So before I kick it over to you, man, to, to walk us through some of your sample stories, just for people who don't know that much about Times or are kind of joining us as a first time webinar, let me give a really, really quick introduction to the platform, the genesis or the origin story as it was, um, and, and really what we're doing at Times and why it's a little bit different. Um, so before founding the company, I spent about 15 years as a security practitioner, working in fairly technical roles, similar to Matt, like instant response, SecOps, threat hunting, intelligence, malware forensics, those type of roles in companies like eBay, PayPal, and DocuSign. Um, it was really while as a more senior executive in security that we began to feel the need for a platform like Times. So I had a team of incredible security practitioners, but as the company I was working at was growing, more and more of their time was spent doing repetitive manual tasks. So running down to phishing emails, responding to EDR alerts, uh, updating trouble tickets, that type of work. And because these folks were security practitioners and not software engineers, they couldn't write the software required to get themselves off that treadmill in order to unlock, as Matt says, those higher impact, more uh, differentiated tasks. Um, and you know, one or two of them probably could have written like a bit of Python here or a small bit of Bash to glue various tools together, but we didn't want literally the company's most mission critical processes hanging off these scripts that were hard to manage, didn't scale, weren't doing credential management correctly, um, and you know, frankly, just weren't weren't web scale enough for us to to leverage. And so we began to look at platforms that would 
allow these folks who knew their jobs inside out, automate their repetitive manual tasks without having to write code. Um, we looked at a number of different platforms over the course of a few months and didn't find anything that was quite right. And so really found at times to build a platform that I wish had been available when I worked in those type of frontline security teams for, for large tech companies. Um, today, we are um, the world's leading no-code cybersecurity automation platform. We have customers from Fortune 5s to public and private SaaS companies, including OneLogin, everything to 50 people startups. We also have about 3,000 companies currently leveraging the free version of our community edition. Um, and the way Times is a little bit different from other automation platforms is kind of in three ways. The first is that we are laser focused on security automation. That is all we do. So we don't do case management. We don't do threat intelligence. We don't do um, analyst collaboration. Instead, we build an extraordinarily powerful, robust, easy to use workflow engine that frontline security teams who don't know how to write code can use to automate their manual tasks end to end um, without having to rely on, on other teams. The second way we're different is that we're fundamentally designed to be used by people who aren't developers. Right? The single most important kind of philosophical belief that we have as a um, in, in the product is that automation is only effective when it's implemented by teams on the front line. Right? It's got to be the folks doing the work day in, day out, who are empowered with the tools they need to automate their own work end to end, again, without relying on external developers or vendor pro serve or so on and so forth. And then the final way we're different is in terms of flexibility. So really, Times is designed to work out of the box with any tool in your stack. So there's no dependency on Python libraries. There's no dependency on pre-built integrations in order to talk to existing tools in your stack. So as long as your tool that you need to automate interaction with has an API, regardless of whether it's SOAP, REST, or GraphQL, Times will work with it out of the box in a consistent way. Um, okay, so Matt, over to you. What's the first thing you're going to show us? Yeah, um, very first thing, and I'll get my screen kind of shared. Um, the very first thing that we kind of wanted to talk to is um, similar to what you were talking about, Owen, where one of the things we've done a lot in the past is work with, you know, a set of uh, IOCs. And um, let me actually get my screen sharing. There we go. Perfect. So yes, one of the things that we do a lot is work with, you know, in known indicators of compromise um, where we get from some sort of data source, um, a list of IOCs. And this could be from a threat intel platform. It could be from a public news source talking about a new threat actor, um, or, you know, it could be, um, you know, we, we have an internal campaign that we've detected where there's, you know, somebody targeting our users with a, a known phishing campaign. Um, so we get, we get, you know, via our analysis or via these other sources, we'll start pulling out known IOCs. And that can be anything like an IP address, it could be a, a hash, it could be a, a URL, a domain, an email, um, any of these kind of things. And we want to start actioning them. So kind of the way that, again, kind of one login is built or kind of approaches these problems is we'll, we'll standard, like create a playbook. Um, and we kind of do those actions pretty manually. So, you know, the, the pre-times, story that we would build out is, you know, we'd have something like a phishing campaign. And so we're going to get who's the email sender, look at the email headers, is it coming from a known, you know, malicious or IP, um, you know, source that we can block in, in terms of like an IP reputation? Um, are there links in the email? Are there attachments in the email? What are the links? What are the hashes? And then, you know, we want to know how many emails were delivered to our employees. Did it only get delivered to one? Was it delivered to 50? Was it delivered to the entire company? Um, and then, you know, did any of those people who received emails, did they click a link? So again, this is all a fairly manual process where we're, we're doing the analysis, we're extracting the IOCs, and then we're having this follow-up work that happens around, um, again, those questions of like who got the email delivered. And so we're looking in tools like our EDR vendor, we're looking in our firewall logs, we're looking at, um, you know, threat intel for any additional enrichment of those IOCs. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that is our IOC actions form. Um, so it's literally that where, you know, I can come in and I can start dumping a list of known IOCs that we've gathered from, um, you know, other, you know, outside external sources and essentially start selecting what do I want, what tool do I want to interact with and what sort of actions do I want to do? And so again, it's, it's enabling us to kind of um, start automating that, that post response action where, 
again, like if I'm worried about an employee who clicked the link and entered credentials, now I can start focusing in or, you know, run this IOC actions form and get data back in, you know, a matter of seconds across several different tools now, you know, um, whereas before I'd have to manually, you know, go into an ADR tool, search for the domain, now go look at the user um, and see if there's any sus sus suspicious logins or anything else like that. Um, whereas now it's, you know, a matter of seconds and I have all of that data and I can throw it into a centralized ticketing system or something like that. And now I only have to look in one place and quickly refresh the page and I'm, I'm ready to start saying, okay, I have one compromised user, I have 15 compromised users or whatnot, and then start, you know, really driving down and, and proceeding down the next steps of our, of our IR plan. So that's kind of the, the general philosophy is we'll create an initial playbook. We do a lot of things manually. And then we're like, okay, we're doing a lot of these <laughs> manual steps over and over again. Let's, uh, let's go to a more um, automated fashion and find what sort of things we can no longer do in a manual way. Um, so, you know, the story is, is overall pretty simple. Um, it's the joy of forms as we get to kind of customize that. I can, you know, if we introduce a new security tool, I can easily add that in. If we wanted to um, build out additional actions, like let's say we wanted to actually not just block or enrich, but we're like, hey, this is a false positive. Let's actually allow this or add this to an allow list um, or something like that. I can easily add an additional action in and then typically tie that into um, kind of the Tynes backend story. Um, so, you know, the story is, is fairly simple. Um, it ends up going to a webhook. Um, we're going to parse our IOCs um, with an event transformation agent. Um, because again, you know, one of the things that I wanted to make sure is that it's fairly freeform and easy for our, you know, different employees and analysts to use. We could have easily built several forms or something like that, one for IPs, one for SHA hashes or whatnot, but, you know, being able to actually centralize everything and have like a more freeform syntax um, in, inside of the form was, was useful and, and a better user experience for a lot of our analysts. Um, so I want to be able to parse out the IOCs and say like, what type of IOCs am I dealing with and, you know, correctly extract those out. And then from there, it really is, it's just, you know, what did the, you know, end analyst um, kind of select and pass through um, as part of the form. If, you know, they're saying, hey, I want to do something and it's an EDR, EDR agent, if it's firewall, if it's, um, you know, threat intel and start building out those additional actions. And so, you know, we'll kind of talk a lot about the iterative nature of Tynes, um, but that's that's kind of it. Is like, you know, we get to build this base story um, around Tynes, and from there, if I wanted to add another tool in, I can easily just add, you know, additional trigger agents in. I can build out the additional actions and, you know, REST API or or whatnot that I need to, um, and kind of just continue to build out from there. And um, you know, it makes it it makes it iterative, um, and it makes it flexible and. Uh, yeah, that's so it's it's overall it's simple, but you know, um it saves time. And that's that's the big point that we wanted to talk to is that um being able to have forms, um, you know, it's a it's an easy UI method, um, you know, to kind of talk to the the Times product a little bit and part of the joy. It's not necessarily perfect for this use case because again, this is mostly internal to um, just my incident response team. But if we ever needed to, we could easily copy or make a form public and start doing something where you know, if we wanted a particular form where, you know, um, the entire company should be able to access that and, and provide information or provide context for, you know, an incident or, you know, to create a ticket for us or something like that, we could easily make a form public and kind of use this same feature uh, and provide it to the, the company wide. Um, so it's definitely something that we've watched. I think we were an early customer, it was pre-forms, and it was something that we kind of talked a lot about in terms of a use case. So this has been something that's actually made our life a lot easier just as a, um, a centralized location to kind of provide IOCs and, and start actioning those, um, you know, and then, and the joy of webhooks, um, we have a form built out and it sends it to this webhook. If we weren't ever in the future, want to start, um, you know, saying like, okay, we, we're going to automate more. We're going to feed like our, our phishing automation into, um, extracting those IOCs and want these actions done automatically. Now we have, you know, send a story agents and we have all of this story pre-built out and all we have to do is slightly format and standardize our data and make sure it gets sent to the story. So all of the backend work stays the same, which is kind of the joy. Um, and then, you know, the front end form kind of gets to help feed into this backend. So, um, yeah, in terms of onboarding brand new employees or whatnot, um, having a form definitely helps make life a lot easier and helps them start taking actions, even though they don't necessarily know the underlying backstory. Um, it definitely helps them start being, you know, effective in their role.
Nice. Matt, this, this is this is incredible. I, I love how you've said a couple of times it's kind of simple. I think a, anyone who's watching this is uh, is not thinking this is kind of simple. It's simple for you, but this is this is really, really impressive. Um I I, I love it. I love a lot about it, but there's two things that immediately spring to mind here that I think are are, are incredible. First is like your guys' user focus, right? Like I think it's yeah. it's something a lot of security teams forget about is that like the user, the experience for your users is often really, really critical. And by users, we're talking about analysts or other frontline security practitioners. If you make it really hard, you know, you, you've kind of suggested that in a different, in a counterfactual world, you could have gone and had like a different form. Here's where you put your IP addresses, a different form where here's here you put your domains, a different form where here's where you put your MD5 hashes, a different one for SHA ones and so on and so forth. But by having this single place for your analysts to come and dump all the content in, they're going to use it more, right? They're going to find it easier. The barrier to entry is, is, is lower for your people to actually start taking action. And, you know, we think about times as our mission is to remove the barrier that prevent teams doing their best work. And so having that kind of philosophy um, come true in the form, I think is really, really exciting. And, you know, it's, it was one action I think you had that actually parsed all that data out anyway. So it's not even that much work for the upside you get in terms of user experience. Um, the, the second thing that I really like about it is just the, the overall function of this story, because often what I found is with security teams, the big incidents, you know, the big critical things that lead to like a priority one or a priority zero incident are rarely the, the run of the mill things like a threat feed that comes through like some really well known threat feed. It's always the kind of things where like somebody sends you an email saying, hey, you know, this IP address is making some weird behavior on our network. Have you seen it? Or, you know, you get a text message from a buddy or, you know, you get a, a phone call from your CEO saying, hey, the folks <laughs> over at our peer company want to talk to you guys. And so it's having the ability to both consume data from external sources in a systematic way, you know, the typically way you would with times where you receive an alert from some system is great. But also then having that mechanism to run ad hoc sweeps across your environment laser fast is really, really important. And I'm just yeah. curious, how often do you see yourselves using this form? Is it like on a daily basis, monthly basis? <laughs> I think <laughs> the sad fact is it depends <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. on, on you know, what, what the threat landscape is looking like and, and you know, all of that. So it can, it can vary. Um, but yeah, you know, on, on a regular basis, for sure. Um, I think for me, I'm probably biased because I was one of the initial kind of builders that worked on the form or talked about some of the use cases. So I probably use it a little bit more than some of our, our new folk. Um, or just joining our team, but um, yeah, I'd say on a, you know, several tickets per day, kind of regular basis. Um, wow. So it's, it's especially for me, I think it's mostly just the, I'm always, I'm probably more paranoid than others. I always want to make sure that, you know, <laughs> it's healthy, it's the it's healthy. Factor. <laughs> I just want to make sure that like, again, even though I'm confident that an alert only happened on one machine or something like that, I want to make sure that it's nowhere else in my environment or anything else. So to me, that's that's the main use case for me is I'm just, I'm not necessarily using the block aspect, but making sure and doing that kind of due diligence and making sure that it's, you know, that that IOC is not popping up on any other, you know, machines anywhere else or, you know, combining it with threat intel is definitely a huge thing. Like any more context that I have just helps um, pivot or dive down deeper into an incident. So um, yeah, I definitely use it on a pretty frequent basis. That's awesome. I, I love the idea of, you know, using it for peace of mind because you can, right? <laughs> it's so cheap, you know, in, in terms of like the amount of time it was take, you'd never do that manually, right? If you were working a ticket queue and you needed like, you, you had an IP address and it was kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, may, I'm pretty confident that that isn't an seen anywhere in our environment. And I know it'll take me 10 minutes to do it manually, so I'm not going to do it. But if it literally takes like kind of three seconds to copy it and throw it into that form, why not? Right. Like it, you have that peace of mind and, um, and and you can sleep easier at night. Um, awesome. Matt. That that was really, really cool. Thank you. And um, what's up next? Yes. Yeah, so next kind of one that I wanted to talk through again, <laughs> kind of bouncing a little bit on the iterative nature of times. Um, let me make sure I accidentally just close that particular story. I actually want that story up. Um, <laughs> and um yeah, so kind of bouncing off of the iterative nature of, of times, 
um, is it's kind of going back to our um, sim system. And so this is a little bit where you know our sim is configured to send all of our different types of alerts and detections into um, into times, and then we'll do a lot of you know downstream processing. And the reason we kind of want to talk about the iterative nature there is because you know we get to build base case use stories where um, you know things that we do on a common basis. We want to create a ticket. We want to update the ticket. We want to send an automated email response. Um, all of these things are, you know, fairly fundamental things that we do, you know, hundreds, thousands of times every single day. And um, yeah, I don't want to do that necessarily manually, but we're going to use it over and over and over again. Um, and so this kind of wanted to just highlight that personally, my favorite thing, because we've worked with, and you know, you in the past own on other kind of tools and systems and automation platforms. But to me, like the send a story was the most exciting thing when we started working with Times because um, that's where that iterative nature started to really actually come into play and being able to use that particular aspect of the platform to kind of just scale um, super easily and use stories in a centralized way or update stories in a centralized fashion. Um, to me, it was the most similar thing to like actual functional programming and being able to reuse a function. Um, I know stories are different and all of that, but it was definitely um, it was definitely a good analogy and parody in my in, in my brain. So you know, it made stories become super neat, super tidy. Um, where we can receive something from a sim, um, you know, similar, like you'll see this, I do this a lot, just habitually, I'm always parsing alert sources and doing sort of, you know, data parsing when it, almost afterwards. But, you know, from there, then I'm looking for, okay, now I know it's a, an alert from G Suite. I know it's a, something about Duo. And now I can go in and I can start building my specific response actions for that particular type of alert um, and, and narrowing it down. And then from here, there, if I dive further into, you know, that particular alert, eventually I'm going to do, you know, IOC enrichment, and I'm going to do all that, but eventually I'm going to end up creating a ticket. So, you know, in, even inside of this individual smaller story, um, then I'm going to, you know, have additional send a story agents and, and kind of bound and, and build upon that. And so it was just, um, you know, something that, that becomes super useful for us because, again, um, I don't have to rebuild things over and over again. If I ever have to make a change or heaven forbid one of our credentials gets compromised and I need to update a credential, I only have to do it in you know a single centralized location. Um, and so that definitely makes things, um, you know, in terms of me as the user, <laughs> um, it makes my life a lot easier um, as, as I'm building the automation out. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely the thing that was most exciting to me. So I kind of wanted to highlight. I, I don't have a huge amount to kind of talk through or demo or anything else, Owen. But yeah. um, to me, it it really was. It was just it it felt like functional programming, and I got to reuse um, what I was doing, and and that was super powerful. And just to just to kind of like latch on to the end of that, to to add some context around almost the origin of, of Send a Story, because when we originally released the package, and I think maybe even before you started using them, Matt, there was actually only six action types, right? So if, if, if you just go back to your screen, Matt, for one second, because sure. it'll, it'll be much easier for me to explain this. <laughs> um, thank you, man. Um, is, you know, when we had this, when we released this product, you know, in the, in the top left-hand side, there was only six of these kind of core primitives or action types, as we call them. And Send a Story wasn't one of them. And the idea with Send a Story really came about from fairly consistent customer feedback that they, like you were explaining there, they wanted to set, create, or they wanted to perform a series of actions that were the same across multiple different workflows or multiple different stories. So you actually had one uh, for the, for the eagle-eyed viewers, you had one in your previous story as well that was like create case, right? And that create case you would be doing those same steps, those same actions in multiple different places, right? You, so you were doing them for your phishing emails. You were doing them if you had an IOC trigger. You were doing them if you had like a cloud trail alert related to like, I don't know, a, an open S, S, uh, SG or something like that. And what we found was that they were having to like repeat themselves over and over and over again. And so we came up with this concept of sent a story. And the idea with Santa Story is you take those actions that you're performing repeatedly and you put them in a single place. And then you use this Santa Story action, which Matt has along this kind of like bottom row. And what happens when Times runs in practice is an event comes in from one of these trigger actions, let's say G Suite alert. And a G Suite alert comes in from, from Matt Sim. Um, and rather than having to go and build these response actions in multiple different stories, they're sent to this single centralized place. 
And when those actions are performed in that substory, that single centralized place, the result is sent back. And so the end user, Matt, in this case, he doesn't even have to know in reality what's actually happening in this G Suite response actions. He just knows that this is what I need to do when I want to do G Suite response actions. Similar in JIRIC or like, you know, the Hive or any other case management system, you can abstract away a lot of the complexity and repeatability and just have this single centralized location. And Similar to you, a lot of our advanced users love this feature because it means that they can have, have strong reliability and strong confidence in the fact that when they're using this action, that it's the same consistent over and over and over again. And you know, when they're doing a GC response action, it's going to be the exact same absolutely everywhere. Um, does that, is that kind of like accurate to how you're using them, Matt? Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. Spot on. And like, yeah, literally the kind of sparking the memory and the sparking the brain. Like the last thing that's super useful is again, like I keep bringing up this topic because we've had a bunch of new hires in terms of like onboarding the usability. Um, like that's another thing that's been asked really wonderful about send to story is, is onboarding new employees is that I can separately make sure I have documentation written for here's how you create a ticket. And I have a send a story. It's all of this back end. They don't need to know about that context. I just need to say, hey, this is what format I need you to send the data in. And all of a sudden now I can have a brand new employee who's been working for a very short period of time and they can start using and the send a story agent and make sure that they have data in the right format. And then they're good to go and they can create tickets off of whatever automation they need to build. So there's definitely um, on top of even that, like kind of iterating on what you said, like it's it's definitely nice to have nice to have this as um you know, there's something that where you're guaranteed to have the same action occur no matter what um, okay. for, for a lot of different use cases. Yeah. I love it. The, the other thing that is glaringly obvious in this um, story is a how neat and tidy it is, right? Like it's, this is really well put together and it's <laughs> like, it's very obvious what's happening, but also there's kind of a glorious symmetry to what's going on here, right? You have this like webhook action that comes in, you have this uh, event transformation action, which is like parsing out the important information from the alerts. And then you're using that important information to make a decision on the type of alert that is coming from your SIM. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth here, but you don't have to, like, once you have that initial alert set up on your SIM, you don't really have to worry about it after that, right? Everything just goes into exactly. times and you do your uh, processing of the alert here. And, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times over the last few minutes, this idea of like the iterative nature of times, right? That you can start with just one of these alerts. And I think what we often find is when we're working with customers, they almost try to boil the ocean at the very start, right? So they're kind of like, okay, I've got all these different categories of alerts. I'm going to, my story isn't going to be ready for production or ready for use until I have them all in there. But with times, with this iterative ability, it's so simple to start small, right? And we encourage our customers, just start with that one thing, right? Just do G Suite alerts. And then once you have that working, then add Duo. And then once you have that working, then add CloudTrail. And so I'm interested, Matt, if you have any idea how long it would have taken you from like the first incarnation of this story to like where it is today. Um, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, honestly, and, and that's probably a, biased answer in my regard, um, <laughs> just because of like some of the tools we've worked with in the past and the, the pre-built knowledge that I had walking into the door with Pines and kind of all of that. But, um, you know, if I was going to build everything from the ground up, pre-send to story and everything else, you know, it might be three to four times longer or more effort than it would be, you know, using kind of the send a story in the iterative nature where kind of this format and this structure where, you know, now, I mean, the reality is now if I have a new alerting source from our SIM, I add a new trigger agent, I add a new send a story, and then I go and build out that story. So um, in terms of like actually receiving and starting to parse alerts and everything else from our SIM, that's absolute seconds now. Um, it takes no time at all, and all of my time just gets sucked into making sure that whatever response actions we have is is built out. Um, but yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, that's the the flexible nature of it. Just becomes um, super easy to start adding new new alerting sources into our sim um, and make sure that that data starts getting parsed into um, times in a super quick and easy fashion. Is yeah, it's seconds. Awesome. 
it would also it would also be remiss of me not to point out that the way we um, price for this application is there's no there's no like you don't get penalized for having for, for for using this setup. In fact, we encourage it, right? Because there's no limit to how many actions or how many blocks you can have in a workflow. So you literally can add, you know, a dozen more, two dozen more, a hundred more alerting sources if you want to, and just kind of scale horizontally out because it's all in that same single story. Yep. Awesome. Exactly. Cool, Matt. Um, we've got one more, I think. Is that right? I think so. Yes. Cool. And it's a little bit more, I don't think I have a good actual demo. Um, That's okay. On that. But, you know, I mean, I know you have a lot of documentation on it anyways, in terms of public, but one of the things I kind of alluded to is, is phishing. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously phishing still a major problem in the security world. So, um, and, and I know times, I think it's fish.report has kind of mm -hmm. a integration or relationship there. Um, and so there's kind of a similar process that we built internally. And, and again, there's nothing super new or major that I wanted to call out. Like, again, most of the features are still the same in terms of if we wanted to build a form, if we wanted to use um, kind of send a story um, or anything else like that. Actually, I'm quickly looking over our story to make sure I can, I didn't have something pre-built for this just because it's a larger story, but um, I can demo this live. So that's, that's fine. Um, making sure there's no sensitive data quickly. <laughs> good, good, good um, yeah, so essentially this would be if, you know, somebody external or internal reports something to phishing that one login. So the very first thing you actually see is the root agent <laughs> that I have here for this, um, or root action that I have is actually a send a story, um, right. which is, again, one of the things we do a lot is we read emails, you know, because we're getting emails to a lot of different distribution lists. So one of the base stories we had is just, I want to be able to read an email. And so <laughs> that's actually that is I, I built out a send a story um, and connect into that. And I'm just going to go and get any emails that were delivered to phishing app. Um, and so from there, you know, if there's um, any sort of ticketing updated or anything else that needs to occur, I'm going to do a bunch of deduplication. Um, so this is kind of the reason I wanted to highlight this at all is because this is where the joy and the complexity of, of times really comes in that, you know, a lot of the stories that we've kind of shown them already have been, you know, simple and they're, they're beautifully simple in a lot of regards and show the power of times. But I also wanted to bring this up because it becomes, it shows how like a very complicated process can be analyzed and processed where, you know, you're looking for something like, um, you know, a phishing email and you're looking at analyzing email headers. You're looking at reputation of who's the email sender. You're looking at attachments. You're looking at URLs. Um, you know, you might be detonating something in a, in a sandbox and then extracting that sandbox report. So there's a lot of different processes and steps. You're going to notice that, and this is why I say I love Send a Story, is because I use it all of the time, all over the place, depending on like, you know, what logical process is going on. That if there's an, if, you know, somebody sent me a, a phishing email and they attached the original email versus um, they sent me the, or just forwarded it or something like that. So there's a lot of different like logical processes um, that kind of go through. And again, a lot of it is, um, you know, we, we kind of create this manual playbook and we're doing things manually. And then we start to automate something like, okay, I just want to make sure that I'm handling phishing tests or phishing drills. And I might so this know, is handle as that you, first. You and then I can an up. internal phishing exercise. And yes. so you don't yep. want to handle them the way you handle, um, legitimately reported for one of a better term. Correct. Nice. Yes. Yeah. And so like, you know, that was like our very first base cases. I just, I didn't need to spend, if I knew that we were running a phishing drill and we're intentionally testing our employees and making sure that security awareness is happening, then, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that I didn't, I didn't need to spend a huge amount of time on that. It's not a threat. I don't need to triage it. So I just wanted to make sure that I'm auto closing those particular incidents. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of the base. And then from there it was like, okay, let's actually start building out everything else in terms of our logic about like, you know, analyzing URLs and everything else. And so it becomes, you know, super complicated over time. Um, but it was super simple to build out to start with. It was just literally, you know, a single line to start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and over time, it gets more and more complicated where we're analyzing headers, we're doing things about, you know, querying URL scan, we're doing things about sending messages and connecting them to Slack. So that way, like, you know, for, for me, again, I'm always paranoid and, and want to just validate results. So after I've done all of this work, I'm going to format data, I'm going to send it to Slack and, and ping me or ping my team. We'll do a quick review of the data. And then from there, I can say like, hey, is this email safe? Is it spam? Is it phishing? And then again, 
I can start, you know, sending automated replies and sending emails. So the reality is in terms of like analyzing a phishing email, it takes me however much time it does to, you know, read whatever automated report results that um, come out of the story. And then I click a button. And now our employees are notified. They've got an email. My tickets are updated. Um, you know, if I needed to hook it into, again, our IOC actions and start blocking emails or, you know, domains or URLs or anything like that, then it's a matter of, you know, seconds. And all I had to do was just read data in a centralized location and click a button. And so, again, like, it's complicated in terms of the back end, but the resulting outcome is my job becomes a lot easier and I get to do things in a much faster fashion. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I kind of want to just highlight it just because of the the complexity so yeah yeah it's 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 amazing you know i i never get tired you know probably over 90 percent or over 80 percent of our customers probably have some sort of phishing workflow implemented in, in some way shape or form <laughs> and I, honestly i never get tired of looking at them because they're always there's always something that somebody is doing that's slightly different right there's always somebody doing something where like either they're using different uh, intelligent sources or they're looking at email headers in a slightly different way, or their ticket is configured in, in, in a different way or so on. What I love about this one is the fact that A, you are, um, A, you're, you're, you're wiping out immediately all those like phishing tests. Like just don't even look at them, don't see them. <laughs> but also yeah. the fact that like, hey, we, we know that this isn't like watertight, that this is never going to be 100%. There's no silver bullet in this world. And so you get to eyeball the results that's already been collected as well. And you can really speed up the triaging of those with all their tickets. And again, none of this is happening, as in none of this triage is happening in times. And what I mean by that is you're not actually looking at times, watching these Correct. events happening. You're in the place where you spend your most time anyway, which is like Slack or your email or pager duty or, or whatever it is. Um, yep. That's really awesome. So, so Matt, we've, we've kind of seen, we've kind of seen three wildly different use cases, right? All kind of very different structures, very different um, architectures for want of a better term. Um, but the great thing about it is that from my point of view, you've done this all with just those seven action types, right? In times, there's never anything constructed that's not using just those seven basic building blocks. And you know, without giving you too big, too much of a big head, you're a pretty legit Python developer as well, right? You you can you can you can crack out some Python when the uh, when when needs must. Well, talk to me about the, like the differences between do, building something in times versus like building it with with Python. Like, what would it have been like to build that phishing triage story in Python? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you kind of touched on some of the things earlier in terms of you know dependencies are an aspect, you know, I have to maintain code, I have to maintain and make sure any dependencies are still working and do code testing. Um, there's also whatever infrastructure that I have to manage that I'm running that particular Python script on. Um, now I have, you know, an additional, some sort of thing that I need to manage and run and secure and lock down because, you know, something like, you know, this isn't necessarily nearly as sensitive, but, you know, it's, it's reading emails. Um, and so that has some level of credentials and some sensitive data in there. And so I need to make sure that my, my data is secure and my analysis is, you know, is, is working properly. Um, you know, there's things like secure coding practices where I have to make sure that, um, I'm not introducing some sort of mistake in my code. That's going to cause a, a, again, this sensitive data to potentially be compromised or anything else. Um, and so those are all kind of things that I would be thinking about as more of like writing in Python, whereas, mm. you know, in times it, it's obviously more like a no code, um, kind of cloud-based architecture environment. Um, so it definitely makes things a lot easier. Um, we didn't really talk about the, the credentials or resource features inside of times, but, you know, there's methods for, you know, securing and, and protecting credentials in a much nicer fashion. Um, I don't have to worry about, you know, doing code reviews or if I, you know, bring a new member onto my team and doing code reviews and making sure that they're, you know, not making a mistake or anything else. Um, so it definitely makes things a lot nicer in terms of like the security aspect where, you know, it's, it's peace of mind that I know something's going to work and um, I'm not necessarily nearly as worried about um, all of the other underlying aspects to make sure that this automation will work. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. And in fact, I think, I think it's one of the lesser appreciated upsides of this like no code movement. Like we all get that the no code movement <laughs> is dramatically reducing the barrier to entry. But also the fact that 
there's this huge security benefits to this as well, right? Because like you say, you're no longer to, like having to run about dependency management and all the supply chain impacts that like that impacts. You're no longer having to worry about like deployment issues and patching. Um, and similarly, like in times, there's actually no way to introduce Python, even if you wanted to. Like even if you wanted to have a little bit of a Python script in times, we don't allow that because of the security risks that it implements and the management overheads and performance impacts and so on and so forth. And um, so really, really great to hear. Matt, we're, we're almost at time, but maybe you could spend like the last couple of minutes we have together talking about how one login are using times outside of security, right? And like kind of the 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 benefits you've seen, because obviously, you know, you guys were the first users, your CSER team or IR team were the first users of times in one login. But since then, it's expanded into like, you know, your your neighbors for want of a better term. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so kind of the, the big kind of partner that we had initially was we work pretty closely with our IT departments. Um, and so, you know, they do a lot of things around onboarding, offboarding, asset management, all of that kind of tasks. And again, um, you know, it's it's a lot of reliance on different tooling and, and the APIs and access that those particular tooling has. And so again, that's the joy of times is, um, you know, IT team has a lot of different functions. Um, and, you know, if they're onboarding or offboarding something, you know, they might be, well, not might be, or one login. So they're using our one login product <laughs> to create and manage our users. Um, and so, you know, they'll, they'll be able to, integrate with our one login API and start saying, okay, I need this particular user has these particular applications or anything else. So they can start integrating and working with, um, you know, onboarding. And then similarly, they can have something for offboarding. Um, and again, we didn't talk about it, but, you know, being able to schedule automation in times, um, they can, you know, I, IT, you can pre-build a form that HR knows, hey, with this particular employees put in their notice, their last day is going to be, you know, December 31st. And uh, we need to offboard this person. And so you could easily pre-build a form um, and provide that to an HR team. They could fill out that form, plunk all that data into it that they need to and start, you know, send it to times and it would sit there as a, a more scheduled job or schedule it. And on December 31st, you've offboarded this person in an automated fashion. Um, so definitely see plenty of value and talked a lot with our IT team about like, you know, what their use cases are and how do we kind of integrate with them. Um, but there's other other areas that aren't just, you know, security or tech standard, technically, you know, tech, like, you know, um, you know, we talk a little bit about, I'm not, not a finance person. I'm not a salesperson necessarily, but, um, you know, one of the things we monitor for is like exports of Salesforce data. And so one of the things they do on a regular basis is they're, you know, calculating like how, how's the company doing this quarter, this month or something like that. Um, so definitely the area of, of metrics, I think is an interesting area to kind of expand or think about times, um, a lot in, because, you know, again, if you're, if you're manually exporting data from a, a sales platform and trying to say like, how much are we meeting our quarterly goals in terms of, you know, net income, um, that's something that, again, you know, most of these tools have an API that you could easily export that report in. you could manipulate that data within times and easily say like, here's the report, here's the numbers, um, rather than having to, you know, download data onto a physical disk, which can be a different security problem in terms of, you know, what happens if that machine gets compromised or anything else. So now you're, you're handling data in a even more secure fashion where it's no longer living on disk, but now in, in kind of these more centralized fashions. So, um, yeah, awesome. metrics definitely, I think are a, a super interesting area that I would play around with for sure. Yeah. So that's awesome. And, 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 you know, you, you, you kind of mentioned that as like a hypothetical, but that's actually what we do internally. So we use times, <clears throat> ourselves for a bunch of those type of use cases, whether it's reporting from Salesforce or, you know, uh, maintaining asset update information and so on and so forth. Um, Matt, listen, I cannot thank you enough. This was really, really exciting. I'm sure the folks who, who watch this like absolutely got a massive kick out of it, as did I. Um, we love what you're doing in the platform. Please continue to do it. We can't wait to see what you do next. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. See ya.